Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Porter with Mining Journal and Mining Magazine. And today I have with me George Aslanis, Integration Manager of Asian Pacific with Epiroc, and Scott Bell, General Manager and Managing Director of JT Mech. And this is part of our 2024 ESG special. Today we're going to be discussing the sustainability transformation in terms of infrastructure, its challenges, and how we're progressing. Scott, let's start with you. What are the key differences between the electrification journey for surface mining operations versus underground mining operations, especially in terms of infrastructure and solutions? I suppose the difference between surface and underground is that um, surface can be isolated, machines can be isolated individually, whereas in underground it's, it forms part of a larger reticulation um, network and therefore any changes, especially to underground, it's, um, it affects um, the whole underground mining cycle of potential and um, supply. So I suppose the, um, you know, the fact that underground probably has more electrif electrified machinery um, in it than, uh, than the surface is a bit surprising because the surface would um, could be easier um, because you can isolate one, one piece of machinery, but um, you know, the full draw and everything calculated from the underground uh, usage it has been mapped and it's, um, yeah, it's the infrastructure changes and challenges are certainly daunting for underground for significant pieces of equipment, but I believe that surface can be, um, yeah, isolated quite easily and, and, and in some, some ways kept independent. I don't know if you want to add something, George. Yeah, I guess the, for the obvious reasons that Scott's highlighted is the environmental considerations that city certainly um, is the key difference. So, and obviously, like you said, um, that input impacts the electrification. Some of the other some of the other differences are really um, the the sources of power and the grid connections can be certainly play a role in, in the environments being different. I mean, obviously, in the equipment types. Uh, between surface and underground are, um, vary. Uh, surface, they're typically for haulage anyway, there's a lot larger, so infrastructure. So that plays a role in the types of solutions um, and supporting infrastructure to support the, to cater for the solutions there. Um, and obviously the design of the mines in underground is uh, is more constrained. So that the impacts the types of solutions that you need to support in terms of infrastructure. So that the lack, the lack of flexibility in underground versus surface um, plays a role in like sort of the type of solutions that you need to cater for in developing a, a strategy for electrification and um, and the mixes there. And obviously that impacts on, you know, things like charges and, and, and other sort of substations. So I think they're probably the main ones. And I guess just to sort of conclude is that the the reason why Ipiroc has developed and acquired companies like JT and others is really to, to to provide the mix of services to to cater for the different environments between service and underground. So I think that's really that circular nature of our strategy. I think that's probably the key thing to note in terms of um, tailoring a solution for both service and underground. Scott, could you elaborate on the challenges the mining industry faces in accelerating sustainability transformation beyond early adopters, particularly in considering support systems and the broader ecosystem, rather than just core BEV technology? Yeah, look, I think some of the issues that we have in accelerating um, the challenges, oh, sorry, the challenges in accelerating the transformation are uh, that um, government itself in some countries has mandated um, some changes and some targets and in other countries they haven't had uh, the same mandates so some countries are, are uh, slower in adapting or adopting new technologies um, larger mining companies who work in broader markets um, and across global uh, or have global representation they can generally, um, you know, uh, transform multiple uh, locations, which is good. I think that helps accelerate it. But isolated 
uh, companies as well who, who may be sitting back and waiting and uh, seeing the first wave of technologies and waiting till they're short up before they step in. And I think that's probably another issue as well. George, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I guess from my perspective, it's the, the challenges vary because um, whilst most companies, you know, may have the similar ESG and sustainability ambitions, the early adopters typically have a higher um, operational capacity and skills base and financial base. So they, and obviously they di differ beyond those adopters. So helping these um, to accelerate them, the, the transformation, you really need to help them understand the financial impacts. So, or and the operational impacts. So preparing them in, in, in the process to accelerate is really important. So that's where things like energy and electric audits can be a bit beneficial in helping them understand those issues because they don't have the appetite for risk um, that maybe the early adopters have. So I think that's really one key um, level there. And obviously the other one is really, we have to understand that the knowledge base and, and capacity um, and the re timeframes that um, differs between the larger early adopters than the smaller, less, I guess, the more the, the laggards, or, as you call them, because they don't have their, um, their timeframes might be uh, different. Um, they might have a shorter timeframe. So we have to educate them on, sustain, I, guess, um, I guess, enabling the transformation in gradual processes and what resources they need and also understanding the change impacts. So, um, so I guess preparing them to um, looking at up upgrading infrastructure for the future of electrification is a key thing and then the impacts on productivity. So really sharing best practice is really a key thing as part of that accelerating that um, knowledge for others to, to start that journey. So, and we know from experience, you know, things like impacts on change management play a role like BIV, um, shift changeovers and charging times and ventilation. And obviously the one that always gets left out is really their skill levels and support levels to support the different um, business models between BEV and diesel. So I think that skill-based change is really a key thing. So the better we educate and prepare and more customers, that, the, that that way we can help accelerate the transformation. Otherwise they'll get in the cycle of repeating I guess some of the lessons of the early adopters, which we don't want to do. So I think that's really important part of the industry to, to share knowledge and transfer that. That's a good point. And it leads into question three. Scott, how is understanding energy needs and conducting audits of electrical infrastructure important to future success? That's critically important. I think it's probably one of the things that um, people are realising uh, now uh, mining companies and, and um, contractors alike are looking at it and going, well, you know, what are the requirements? How much uh, energy do we require underground? Have, do we have the capacity in the current infrastructure? What additional infrastructure will we require to actually run all the electric equipment? Um, so it, it is a big change and, you know, we, we've we do audits um, on a lot of different things um, for capacity, and uh, yeah, it's probably critical going forward. And, and you know, the one that's really highlighted is probably um, the ability to have um, battery electric storage systems in large capacity uh, somewhere to to really be able to push um, you know a shift change when everybody's charging up, or you know how How's that going to affect the grid? How, can can um, energy companies supply that um, that peak load? Um, you know, what is the benefit of, of shaving that peak by having um, not only in a cost uh, focus, but also with a focus of being able to you know um, charge that equipment at the end of shift and, and make sure it's ready to start again? Um, you know, so I think those those questions are really important. And, and auditing and understanding your electrical needs going forward will be critical in, in getting it right. Because if you do get it wrong and you spend a lot of money on new technology that uh, doesn't charge quickly enough and or you don't have the capacity to, to actually do it, then you know, the additional cost will be significant. Thanks, Scott. Um, George, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I think Scott's covered a lot of the points that um, I would like to, I guess I was going to touch on. So. I guess fundamentally what it is, it helps with manage the risks 
of starting an electrification journey. So I think from a strategic perspective, that risk management um, considerations, I guess, play fed into the needs for have the benefits of having these audits and to identify the weaknesses, I guess, understand investment needs and resourcing operational stuff. Uh, and obviously the key thing that people forget, it's a bit like automation when you mind set up a mark and the communications network for a automation, you need to understand the impact on the grid uh, for energy um, and also plan for future. So really, I think that can help in that process. And obviously from a corporate governance perspective, it helps with understanding what reports and information they need to meet their ESG and sustainability um, requirements. So um, I think that's really a key, um, a key consideration, provides a foundation for that sort of, for that journey. So uh, typically when, like Scott said, we do an audit, they'd really identify those areas as consumption, even waste areas and costs, and it helps them to, I guess, manage that risk of moving that transition to electric vehicles. So I think it, it plays a key role. And it's something we're trying to educate a lot of minds around the benefits of that. So we're, I guess, that's one of our key strategic, I guess, capabilities is really to help customers on that journey. Thank you. And you mentioned agnostic solutions. Uh, Scott, when you discuss accelerating the electrification journey, can you talk more about this? Yeah, uh, look, the agnostic solution um, is uh, uh, something that was... Uh, Epiroc focus when they purchased us uh, a couple of years ago because you know this Epiroc has a percentage of the market and other OEMs have a uh, percentage as well and we don't want to ignore the other OEMs and their equipment and um, we need to be developing solutions for all especially to hit a combined target um, and you know we work closely with other OEMs and providers. Uh, for solutions, and we don't see that. Um, you know, Epiroc is a company have invested in us. We've invested in technology and, and um, in people to you know, enhance our footprint to develop a better result, not only for um, our clients but um, other clients as well. And that's the probably the agnostic approach. Do you want to add something to that, George? Yeah, I mean, I guess one of our considerations is that we believe um, that electrification is more than BEV equipment, so you need to have agnostic solutions. So I think that's really the key thing to note. So a lot of our products and charging products are based on industry standards and really probably, uh, so I guess, align them with GMG guidelines. So um, that's really, um, you know, with JT Mech, I've got this, for example, these light vehicle chargers, which aren't specific to Epiroc, the industry standards. So, because we understand, like I said, to help, we want to accept, help our customers on that journey. So, and, and typically it doesn't always involve our our equipment. So, you know, the solutions need to be, um, you know, more industry based. And the other, you know, battery uh, solutions, storage solutions are agnostic. JT Met developed substations from um, construction companies, which also can be applied to obviously mining operations. So it's really understanding that electrification is more than just biblic equipment. So you need to have solutions to support our customers on those different areas. And I think that's really part of the challenge the mines have is that um, to understand that the infrastructure plays a key role to support the ambitions and having solutions like agnostic solutions like we have, I guess, provides us with the ability to be um, a bigger provider in that space and help accelerate um that that transformation so and, and i think there's always in, 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 interconnections and inter integrations with other equipment so having experience like that um helps reduce risks and we've got experiences with other customers now who are on a journey that sort of understand the importance of connecting with third-party suppliers with cables and other things that makes it important to reduce some of the risks and, and focus on that transformation journey being a bit more seamless and i, I would like to add as well george that uh, clients have more than one brand of equipment. They might have exactly. five or six, five or exactly. six brands of equipment. Uh, it could be ten. So you know, if you we need to offer solutions for all. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, George. And George, I'm going to direct the last question to you. How does Epiroc prioritize and ensure the safety, the health, and the well-being of its workforce, as well as the communities in which it operates? And how are these considerations integrated into your governance framework? Okay, it's a, it's a very um, topical theme and, and 
from a, being a global leader in, in, I guess, in mining and sustainability, Epiroc does have um, a widely communicated goals, which are part of our corporate presentations and really, just, I guess, focus on our missions for 2030. For example, we have these goals for people on planet. So we talk about roadmaps for people and safety and also, you know, our cultures and obviously the planet ambition. So um, that's that's a key, um, I guess, report, which is announced in our annual report and there's also a sustainability sort of update for the market. So we recognise that it's important to be, um, you know, transparent in how we achieve these ambitions. And internally, in terms of governance, we have an EPIROC way, which covers our safety and health and workforce as part of our overall management systems. And there's a group policies covering all of these guidelines. Um, and so, which we're basically aligned with local customers' environments because the sustainability levels and, and I guess integration with communities um, you know, need to be tailored towards local um, scenarios. So we have that flexibility with the local CCs, like in Australia, we're working, uh, you know, with this um, um, uh, collaborations with local organisations to support that. I guess strategically also we have a VP for sustainability, so who actually drives and, and, and from a cultural perspective and process. And, and so we actually promote a, those policies and coordinate them. So. And then um, from a sustainability goals, there's, we have um, you know quite a few UN um, chart. Um, there's yeah, I guess a lot of reports that we sort of framework to to align ourselves with global um, you know leading market um, reporting levels like um, United Nations guidelines on market considerations. So it's really much embedded in our culture. So I think. Um, Epiroc does take uh, the you know sustainability and safety of its workforce as a, as a paramount, and so there are a lot of operational and compliance guidelines there which navigate that. And as and as Scott knows, we have KPIs specifically for each organisation to how and how we're tracking each year to to track and report on each individual safety reports, and obviously also now uh, KPIs on our operational sustainability goals. So. Um, it's really much embedded part of our operating um, planning perspective and also as part of our culture. Um, you know, for example, our, um, our internal meetings, we always talk about the safety first um, and also sustainability targets. So I think it's, you know, it's really becoming more embedded in our culture. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you both and we look forward to hearing more about your journey. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.